Today in the Teardown channel, we're going to be taking apart this Bon Chef mixer. Here's a couple of things to keep an eye out for. Why is the rotor shaft have a little dome end at the end? Huh, it's kind of curious. And wait, they're using these spherical bushings instead of cylindrical bushings. Why? Huh, what if I wanted to measure the transmission ratio of the gears and also the speed of the motor? How can I do that easily? Hello and welcome to the Teardown channel. My name is Eddie. Last term I was hoping to teach a machine design course where you teach students how to design a machine from scratch. Think of it as a 3D printer. How do you design a 3D printer from scratch? And as I went through the process of teaching machine design, one of the students asked me how I essentially became an engineer and developed such a wide breadth of knowledge from electronics, heat transfer, fluid dynamics, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And I smiled. And the reason why I smiled was because I thought about all of the things that I have taken apart. And anywhere from taking apart printers to the engine of a car. Now, that said, I put a lot of it together. Sometimes I had extra parts. Sometimes it didn't work so much as, as it, well as it used to. What was constant, though, is how much I learned from taking something apart and learning and asking how or why did they do this. So I decided to take apart a shredder for them. Uh, I had a shredder that had broken and I figured, ah, let's learn together. And as I was taking things apart, I was looking at why did that break? What was overheating? What, what's the problem? And the students got really engaged and they were like participating in it as well. And they were like, what are you thinking? So I started giving them my, my thought process, you know, I'm following the structural loop. And I start at one point and then I try to work my way out and I start looking at the, what analysis can I do to determine how this failed? Which when you do that, it's called the root analysis, uh, getting to the, find a problem. Now, industry also has this other thing called a teardown process. And a teardown process consists when you take a product and you take it apart for the purpose of understanding both the engineering, the manufacturing, and as much as you can about that product. Now, we're going to be taking things apart here and looking at them. It's going to be almost like micro teardown. Because as we take it apart, instead of doing the full in-depth analysis, the purpose of this channel is to actually give you a glimpse of parts of the teardown process. So we're going to, as we take apart different elements, you're going to get to see different aspects of the teardown process. Now, in all of this, the purpose of this channel is to inspire. It's to inspire curiosity. So when I take something apart, if I don't cover a specific aspect that you're curious about, you can you know, put a question of, on the comment section or start looking it up yourself on Google or YouTube or you pick your favorite search engine. Now, as you're doing all of this, the most important thing to keep in mind is safety. Okay, so make sure you wear safety glasses. Do not turn anything on when it's open. Take off your jewelry and as you go through this, you're going to be potentially at the beginning making mistakes, right? And you're going to see that as well that I, I will potentially say, oh, this is a potentiometer. Hey, that's not a potentiometer. That's a switch, right? So if I make a mistake, just bear with me. This is the first time that I'm doing this. I'll try to get better at it. I'll try to edit things out and I'll try to put like error, error corrections as I go along. So just remember, we're trying to learn together. We'll, we'll work on it as much as I can. I'm trying to share with you what we can do together to, to learn how to make better machines. What we do here is going to be only a fraction of what industry does all the time. This is just to give you a glimpse into it. And our first project is going to be taking apart this Vonshaft mixer. So I bought it just so 
something that you could be familiar with it's in the kitchen I use it for for baking and we're gonna look at what the motor is inside how does it work how does it switch between the five speeds what the power transmission is and we're gonna try to learn from this together how to take something apart and put it back together such that it works and in the process we're gonna see what else we learn along the way so just remember completely open-minded teaching aspect let's have fun let's learn from it and let's be safe before we start taking anything apart it's really important that you have a clean space with all your tools organized so this is where I work you'll see Allen keys metric in English you'll see screwdrivers wire cutter I also have tweezers here and I have another pliers and cutters here this is the Von Chef mixer that we're going to be taking apart today it comes with five attachments that get connected through these ports now we first are going to make sure that it works and that everything runs happily now when you take things apart you're going to want to actually have a design notebook or a just scratch pad where you actually put your questions in and or sticky notes as part of this what I'm going to do is I'm going to label all the components and actually have them in a big panel such that we can have it towards the end of the video or on the website so let's get started first we're going to make sure that it works outlet it, this particular unit this is the turbo so you can actually hear that when you put the turbo it goes faster and then this is the ejection button for the attachments so the attachments go in now we're going to put them with the attachments and go so that said we look like we work one of the things that's going to be done later is we're going to do an experiment to measure the RPM of these units of the attachments so let's unplug make sure that the plug is in your hand and then you can trace it back and now we can actually start taking things apart so the attachments up there so one of the things that I like to do is I like to put things in little bins or bags to make my life easier and to make sure that I don't lose anything. So I'm going to bring my little bin here. Let me put the tool somewhere else. I just need to go a little bit higher. And remove that. Alright, so the attachments are there. We're just going to leave them in the corner. And we're going to need a Phillips, it looks like. So, what am I looking for? I'm looking for holes or ports where in the bottom I can see screws. And these look, so I have one, two, three, and I have a fourth one here. And they look like to be Phillips. So, let's get the tool. The, let me move the bin aside so I can have more space to work on. Now it looks like this machine is made out of two shells that are put together via these four screws. There's an injection molded plastic at the top. There are two little silver ones, injection molded plastic on the sides. Okay. One of the things that I like to do when I take off the screws is try to put them back exactly where they were so I don't lose them. 
Otherwise, at the end, you're going to be like, where does this screw go? Oh. That one looks like it wants to stay in there. Okay. Four screws. So we're going to try to get this open. So I'm just trying to slowly open it up. There are things within the injection molded part that are called lugs, which are for alignment. And there's also snap clips. So I'm trying to be really careful not to break it. Because remember, we want to put this back together exactly how we found it. So that it still works. So have one shell, really cool. And the other shell here. So let's look at what first came off. This piece, injection molded plastic, it looks like this silver thing is just an accent piece. And I'm looking for what I mentioned earlier, that were just alignment feature. So that is called a lug. It looks like a lug, L-U-G. And this is a snap fit back there so I should be able to remove that cantilever. For this purpose we're going to leave it. Now if you look at an injection molded part we're going to be looking at things that are called emboss. And these are raised features that allow us to come in with the screw and put them in there. And the, the embosses have also things called ribs and they are almost these little features back here that give structural integrity. It, when you design injection molded parts there's an entire physics behind it that goes into what is the wall thickness that needs to be uniform. In these actually it's recommended between 50 to 60 percent of the thickness such that you don't create shrinkage on the back. So there's an entire science that we can do behind just injection molded parts. For this case, we're trying to get into this component a little bit more. What can I say about this is that these are little rubber elements. And there are two here, one here and one here. And they look like they hold on to the motor assembly right at these two points. So one here and one here. Looks like the motor is just held by that, those rubber assemblies. There aren't any additional screws on it. So we're going to put this aside. Now let's look at the, the rest of it. This is a boss feature and it looks like it's tapered inwards right here. And that's where the other screw comes in from the back side sticks through here and gets into the other boss raised features. What are we looking at here? Here's the turbo button. There is one spring here. And let's actually go systematically. And the way that I usually like to do it is I start with the power. So the power is coming in. It, the cable is being clamped down here by this little piece of plastic with two screws and then I keep going. This looks to be either the most likely the hotline and the reason why I say the hotline meaning the the dangerous one, the one that will kill you if you touch it is because usually you want the hotline directly to the motor and everything else to direct the neutral line which is what closes the loop. So let's follow the neutral. The neutral comes here. There's a, an addition cable here. So this is heat shrinked. And there is a switch. So this switch looks like when you press the turbo button down and it's preloaded upwards by that spring, when you press it down, this switch gets engaged and it goes to the transformer of the motor. There's a switch here, let's see if we can get to it, that goes through the different stages and routes power 
accordingly through different coils such that it makes the motor spin faster. This is the ejection of the attachments which are preloaded upwards by two springs and these are compression tapered helical springs. This is a transmission system. We're gonna go and do the transmission ratio of this unit here to figure out what it is and then determine if it's a worm gear or helical gear. From it, we have now the fan here. This motor, this is the rotor that rotates. So if you look at the rotor, there are actually, there's a machine section here. I don't know if you can see that well. And there's also another machine section here. And those are to balance the motor after it's manufactured. So there are, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around. I'm just looking at the different components and going through stream of consciousness. The brushes are here, so I'm going now to the hot side. It's connected to a little pad there. This is a spring, a torsion spring, and this is a brush that connects to the commutator. And the rotor is free to spin. Okay. Now I'm assuming if I go and I measure the resistance of all of from one point to all the other locations, they're going to vary, hence the change in velocity via the switch. There's a patent that goes over this technology, so I'm actually going to put the little patent number here on top. And uh, if you're more curious about it, by all means, go for it. I'm going to make a SolidWorks CAD of the internal components and then label them, and they'll be on the website. So let's start getting this out. This is the snap fit that I'm trying to get out. So this is an aesthetic piece. When I talk about the lug, the lug is this alignment features that they are they serve for alignment, but they actually don't have this raised area that's right here. So this is the difference between a snap fit and a lug. Lugs are for alignment. So let's put that aside. Here is the turbo button with the spring. And the spring just provides a preload upward. So we're going to put that in our bin. Here, let's take off the that part. That looks like it's an injection molded part. Yes, and that one actually says ABS plastic. Let's put that aside and put the compression springs aside. Ooh, the switch, I want to take it out, but there is one screw back there. So we're going to twist them out and now come out. I'm going to take the little screw and just so I don't lose it, I'm going to put him right back to where he was. This is just practice for me. I leave it there. Okay, I want to take out the power so I can dismantle all of this. In order to do that, I'm actually going to need to connect something else. Let's see. Soldering. Bring that down. and get this going. Over time, you're gonna want to invest in tools such that you can do your work. When I started out taking things apart, I had something like this, where it just directly connects to the AC line and it just heats up the tip. As I started doing this more often and playing, 
and I say playing because for me this is really fun just taking things apart and figuring out how things work as I start getting more into this work I started investing in additional tools so even if you use the other one you're gonna to want to put something where it holds a tip just for safety we're going to disconnect things this is the hotline first and then here is the neutral I'm just gonna heat it up and put it away and here to give me more room and flexibility here I'm going to just take away that constraint and I'm just taking those two screws out one of the things that you can do as part of a teardown is do the part count and then do an analysis on how long it takes to assemble based on the number of parts and the steps there's an entire science behind this and even the design for assembly there's a really good book in a class that I took by Professor Dan Whitney. You'll find that on the website where you do design for assembly. So this is a little protector for the cable. We'll put that aside. And now I can take the entire cable out. Great. And we are done with this tool. So let's put it upwards and turn it off so we don't forget about it accidentally. Now this should be free to go. And let's see. Yes, it is. So just like in the first shell, you now we had two rubber components. This one has two rubber components. Something really curious that I noticed right now is, look, this color plastic is different than this color plastic and it's not just a, a side thing of which side is uh, the lighting they're actually made probably in two different locations that's really cool alright so let's put these aside those are the two shells that's the top and now we're looking at the motor with the switch so as you go in different velocities, this piece that is stamped metal is actually making the snap sound when it's going over these little race regions. I can show that later. And then it's making contact. So that goes through one winding here in the back and then it goes through yellow, which is here. Let's see. Let's I, I, I could also remove the, the solder from here. Actually, I'm going to leave it all connected. I don't want to mess too much with it. Let me just work on the motor and, and, and do what we're going to do there. So I went to an arbor press and took off the fan by holding the fan underneath and pressing down and make sure that I get the motor from the from the bottom two screws need to take those out and I can see two more screws that connect to the bottom so one of the things to look at this is Saint Benet's principle of characteristic dimensions how to hold a gear you want to hold it by three to five characteristic dimensions one characteristic dimension being the diameter of the actual shaft in this case this is the diameter and because it's held on both sides this is properly constrained let's start uh, screw is out and the other screw is out so these are machine screws Okay, let's see, pops out, the gears appear to have this lube on it, because of the different materials, it, 
doesn't actually need the loop, but that's how they're putting something there. Really interesting part. They have a little washer here, but they don't have one on the other side. So I'll look into what that can be when, when I do the CAD. Oh, the attachments. So when you put the attachment in, let's see if we align it. There's looks like there's a little spring in there. So this little raised sections of the attachment push that spring apart and then it snaps in. And that's what actually holds the attachment from coming out. Cool. All right, let's take that out. Gear. And now I'm just putting all of this in the little bin. And remember, because I don't want to lose the screws or try to remember which screw goes where, I just put it right back to where it goes on there. Good. Let's get to the next one. Oh, there is a spring right here with two washers. So that's actually a preload. Uh, okay, let's uh, take them apart. Let's see if we get the other one out. During all this time, you should be taking notes as you're taking this apart. I actually have the video to help me out. And one of the reasons why you always want safety glasses is because if something is preloaded and you take, let's say, a part off and there's a spring behind it, especially when you're taking apart something for the first time, you don't want that spring to hit you in the eye and then you get hurt. So keep in mind, anything you do, you want to do it safely. That's why we disconnect the power from it all. Take that out. Here is the. Wait, are you stuck somewhere? Yeah, it looks like it's stuck somewhere. Oh, the reason why it's stuck is because of the brushes. They're holding it back here. So let me just take something to remove them. I'll take a slot it. Looks like there's a spring here. Oop, there it is. It was that little spring. This that you're seeing used to be called a brush because it actually used to be a brush that makes contact with the commutator. See, it's. Let me take the second one off. And this is just a spring. Come on, little one. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There you go. Huh. So, here is the motor. Or part, well, part of the motor, the rotor. These are the brushes. So, the way these work, they come from either side and they make contact with the commutator. There's an entire section on motors and we can spend two, three hours on that alone. We're going to do a little bit of the math behind this and you'll see that on the website as part of the experiment. See, I have a spring. Where is... Oh, there it is. Remember that we said that there were two washers? Here's one washer, here's the other one. This is part of the small details you should be careful of when you take something apart and write down and make sure you don't accidentally lose a part and why you should take photos of it. So that spring is preloading the rotor to actually move in one direction such that it wants to move in the other one there's a constant force f equals kx it goes into the other direction now there's that part here switch the switch that changes velocity you'll see that on the pattern this is the bypass for the turbo engaging different coils there. We'll put that aside. These are the holders 
for the gears. Oh, that's actually kind of interesting. So if I look at this, this is stamped metal that is bent afterwards. And it's actually, oops, I dropped something. This surface is curved. So if I were to pick up and what I dropped was that other washer, this and put it there, this way the gear is giving it one flat surface in which to actually support itself there. So that's the reasoning for that little washer. So let's put these aside. I'll get that one later. Here are the the brushes. Take these two screws out, and they are, oh, they're threaded here, so let's put you in there for now. These are springs, torsional springs for preload on the brushes. It's clamped there, let's see if I can get them out. One, two, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, ooh. Come on, let's be nice. It's, oh, there it is. So we have two of these little springs, put them aside. This piece of plastic is just holding the brushes and the springs together. That's one screw there. We're just gonna put that aside for now. This is, so like I said, I, I looked at this a little bit earlier to basically see what we can learn from it. This bushing here is not a standard bushing which is cylindrical. This is spherical and you'll see that in the CAD model that I create. The six little tabs here on the side are essentially working like fingers and they grab onto that spherical bushing and hold it down and what it prevents it from doing is if the motor for some reason and I'm gonna put it this way is misaligned that bushing will be able to accommodate that misalignment whereas a cylindrical bushing is going to actually fight the alignment a little bit because of just the geometry so that's a really nice design there where it's just that bushing alone allows for the alignment of the shaft all the way through from the first to the last component. And these are the features that we saw earlier for balancing the motor. Okay, that said, the other cool thing that I just noticed on here is that the end of this shaft has a little dome shape and I'm assuming that is because when this is preloaded back it makes contact with a flat and you don't want to do contact with an outside diameter that's pretty large because then that in involves more drag via friction so you do it at a point that's actually really nice there so we're gonna finish up the CAD put all of this in a model and then do the experiments and the analysis that goes with it as we assemble it all back together. All right, the motor assembly is has been taken apart and then recreated in SolidWorks. So one of the things that I'm gonna do is show you how I start the SolidWorks design process or cutting uh, the unit and then run you through the difference between what an engineer does, what a cat development does, and then what a you know holistic person who is an engineer does. So I usually start with the part. I get the part and I start drawing and sketching it out. And this is what I did for this part and just measuring with the calipers. This section is the one that goes back here and holds the two little springs that holds these little guys which remember this is what we mentioned that these are the brushes 
although they used to be brushes but they're no longer brushes with the springs that actually have it preloaded to contact the the commutator so after I make the initial sketch like this it makes me a lot more efficient when I go into SolidWorks so this one is for this part uh, one of those little springs which is up there I have it here and I basically write out you know roughly what it is wire diameter the OD the ID the pitch as I measure them up with the caliper I also have pieces of plastics that are like this this is the ejection button that pushes both of those mixing tips or definitely the whisk both of these little mixing tips out and pops them out of that spring so when you push it it goes bleep, pushes them out and so I start doing the same thing I draw it up you know rough put, put my dimensions and as I go in SOLIDWORKS I start checking them off what I'll discover sometimes is that ooh what's that critical dimension oh I didn't have it so I, rem I actually have to go to the part and measure it when I do this by the way I try to make sure that I do the design for manufacturing and design for assembly as I go along it's easy to just cat something but as you cat it you have to start thinking about okay what do I actually have to do when I make this part what are the molds is it going to be injection molded is it bent so without further ado let's move off to the SOLIDWORKS this is the 3D CAD model that I created using the physical part measurements that I took using a caliper. Now, the really great part is it allows me to look at it from three dimensions as well as take cross sections and take measurements from different points of view. Now, if we wanna take it one step further, which is the detailed engineering, if we take something as simple as the compression spring for the turbo button, now, if I want to change the material properties or the dimensions of it and understand its F equals KX behavior, I actually have to take it somewhere else other than the model. And that somewhere else is something, for example, like a spreadsheet. This spreadsheet, I can change the material, the geometry of the compression spring and understand what its F equals KX behavior is based on equations as well as understand where it's operating related to its maximum shear stress. So whether you're designing a small compression spring or a large compression spring such as this one, you use a system of equations to understand how it's going to behave before you manufacture the spring. This is the experimental setup to measure the transmission ratio. I have a ruler here with vice grips and let me mark that a little bit in pink the edge so now you should be able to see it a little bit better and then I have a needle here that is marking the location on the driven gear so as I rotate the fan it's gonna go and and have a full rotation in the driving gear and then we're going to count how many rotations of the driving gear results in one full rotation in the driven gear. So let me zoom in. And we're going to stay in alignment. Make sure we don't move anything else. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 13, 14, 15, 16, 
17, 18, 19, 20, 21, looks about 21 and a quarter to get almost to the exact same location we're gonna do the experiment again just to make sure so after I measured the 21 and a quarter or so using the uh, the other setup where I had the needle pointing on top I was off by roughly on my second round I was off by about a quarter of a turn so I decided to go and move outwards and put the needle on one of the tooths on the outside tooth and then I did the same thing where I rotated the fan and got consistently 21.5 rotations of the driving gear will generate one full revolution of the driven gear so our transmission ratio is 21.5 with all the things dismantled now we can actually start doing our part count the housing consists if we take each half shell of four different components two rubber elements that are used to actually hold the entire internal motor assembly housing and housing both of those injection molded so we have four here four here one injection molded aesthetic piece and then the power cable which because this is an additional unit and not off the shelf that is one cable heat shrink and the other cable so we have 12 in total up there for the motor and power transmission components we actually have if we just take the rotor we have three components there's a washer a spring for preload and then the washer assembly for even just one side of the helical gear you have a metal washer a spring here at the bottom and then the helical gears that were injection molded now the bushings that are actually one here and one here are not your standard cylinder bushing they're actually spherical and they go into this housing bracket and then this is the retainer ring there's a really good reason why this is actually that type of bushing and not just your standard cylindrical bushing and the back side has the same thing on it uh, one of the really nice things to pay attention to is that when you look at the motor assembly in the back this is actually not just flat that section is has a little dome like device and the reason is that if you're going to make contact with a surface you want to make sure that that is a point contact just in case this is back and it's rubbing and taking the axial loads such that you minimize your friction one of the really interesting things about this mechanism which by the way gets into one of the key questions is this is a helical gear uh, along with the two pairing gears or helical gears there is a fundamental difference between a helical gear and a worm gear one of them the worm gear is sliding contact where the helical gear is rolling contact okay and there's going to be more reading available about that in the links and on the website now if we get to all the little smaller components here in the green folder right this without counting this assembly alone there are 28 uh, parts right there uh, on their own and it doesn't seem uh, like it at first but it, they add up and so each screw counts each spring counts as an independent part now this entire assembly or sub assembly there are 23 independent parts in here so in total even without those additions you're looking at a part count of roughly 76 different components 
before you even begin to add the attachments on it. And this is how part count goes. So now we're going to start doing the assembly. The assembly process is one of the most interesting parts of a teardown because you're using your notes and your wits in order to actually put it all together. So, that said, it took me about 25 minutes to put it together the first time. So let's actually speed things up a little bit. We're starting from the back of the motor and we're moving our way towards the gear. There's that little holder. That holder is for the two brushes that are from either side that go to the commutator. And then those two are the little springs that actually make contact and they press on the brushes so as they wear they keep a force on it such that they stay in contact with the commutator and you saw almost that I, I forgot to put the the stator in and then I was like oh go back put the stator in silly things like that are gonna happen by the way and be like oops oh always check it that a motor rotates freely after you assemble things and remember that that alignment of the motor is actually really cool because of how they're using those spherical bushings uh, you want to have those needle nose pliers in there and sorry about taking the things off screen it feels like the I can see what's happening but you cannot <laughs> oh the alignment of those, that little plate onto the front mount is actually relief then you have to pay attention to the detail of the design if you if you look at the actual part it, it's pretty nice how they actually relieve it such that you're not over constrained alright so we have both of the gears in there also the gears one of the things that you'll notice that I didn't check for is the alignment in the attachment they actually have an orientation and they need to be about 90 degrees. If you don't, when you put the attachments in, they're aligned and then they're going to go clink, 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 clink. So I have to take it apart and figure that out later. All right, there's, there it is on the shell. Again, sorry about the, the misalignment on the camera. I also take it out of camera view for a couple of times, which is actually pretty entertaining. It's what happens when I, I get into the groove and I'm like, okay, what am I trying to do here? Figure it out. All right, so that is the switch getting installed. And that right there, putting the top panel on top of the first half shell, it, it's gonna give me a headache and it actually makes me feel want to play this song in my head. Things are gonna get easier. It's gonna be a headache waiting to happen. Yeah, so here comes the, the button to eject the attachments. One of the things that I like to do is I usually will put music in the background when I'm assembling this. It's like, oh, okay. What am I doing? Trying to figure it out. And it's part of it. Sorry, it's out of the screen again. Alright, so I get the, the button in. Have it all aligned. Here comes the round number two of trying to put the turbo button. And, and the issue is that that top section, you see how it just falls to the side. The top section has two alignment features and two snap fits but they, it only goes from the top down and this is one of the reasons why I suspect that there must be a fixture that they're using in the assembly plan so hence the need for design for assembly there may be a fixture on this 
And one of the ways that I found that it works for me, and it's not in this round right now, it's in the next one, it's actually, I hold it a little bit downwards, and then I use gravity to hold everything in place as I clip things in. Oh, also, uh, I made a really bad mistake here, which was, okay, fine, I wire everything up, but I plug it in without fully closing the entire shell. You'll see it in a bit. And this is all part of, hey, be careful. Even though you're nervous, you may make a mistake. So this is where we're putting in that piece to hold the plug cable down. And now we're going to need to come in and solder those ends in place. Remember to keep your notes of what went where, but in this case it's easier. Try also not to get burned. Those tips stay, stay pretty warm for about 10-15 minutes. So never put it on a table. Always put it on the holder. So here comes the second shell. Nope, that's not working. Okay, so try to align it again. No, okay. Then I find out, oh, no, no, the, that top part has the two lugs, so I have to actually close this first and then put the top section in. Great. Now I try to see the little spring is rolling off. Yep, okay. That's there. Yeah, look, we even get sirens for getting it right. You know, it's kind of like a parade. All right, get it there. Testing the turbo buttons. See, this is where I actually plug it in. But I don't even have the turbo button in. I just wanted to make sure that it worked. But, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Assemble everything first and then stay clear. So there it goes. Nope, that didn't work. That's on like the third, fourth try. And this is where I put it backwards and then snap it in. And that's actually what ended up working. So at the end of this, it took about, like I said, 25 minutes. This is three and a half times the speed. Put the four screws that hold the two shells together and we call it a day. This is the experimental setup to measure the revolutions per minute of the Von Chef at its slow speed and its high speed. So I have the machine itself clamped to the table. I have this little flag with an X and then I have the iPhone which has a slow motion video option. What I do afterwards is I process it and I slow it down to 2% of its actual speed and then I count the number of revolutions. I finished collecting the data from the video and processing it and now we're gonna put it in table form. So I start with video number, the setting of the speed from the Von Chef. I also put the revolution that I count, the time to determine the RPM. So when I first did this, it was actually really interesting. Main reason is I took my first video and this is the lowest speed setting. And I measured anywhere between 25 and 26 revolution in about a two second period. And what was interesting is when I did the math, this comes in so you multiply 60 divided by 2, which is 30, times 25, and this is going to give you about 750 RPM. And this seemed really high. So I said, oh, okay, let's do the slow video again. Maybe I'm missing something. So I did a second video on the low setting, and then I measured 50 revolutions in roughly about 4.2 seconds. And what that gives me is 750 RPM. So I actually did a measurement with a tachometer and it's basically on the money. 
around 700 and change. So I was like, oh, this starts at really high speeds, even in the slowest setting. So then I did the high speed measurement. So this is the third video, and this is high, so high dash turbo. And for that measurement, I measured anywhere between 33 and 34 revolutions in roughly about 1.8 seconds. And what that comes out to is about 1100 RPM or 1130 RPM. So as I told someone, this goes from high speed and if you watch Spaceballs to ludicrous speed. And this is the slow speed, which is about the 750 RPM. And this is the high speed, about the 1100 RPM. That's it. We have our revolutions per minute. We are done taking apart our first product, the Von Chef Mixer. I learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot as well. What I learned, by the way, from it was that it's a little bit scary. It's scary doing something for the first time. And while I've been taking apart a lot of things in the past, taking something apart that I've never taken apart before and recording it at the same time, feels a little bit weird. So I imagine that when you're taking something apart that's new that you've never taken apart, it's gonna feel weird, it's gonna feel scary, you're gonna be afraid of breaking it. And that's okay. That fear is okay. Um, what you do with it is what's important. So make sure that as you're doing things, you keep your safety in mind, okay? Make sure that things are unplugged. Also, make sure you write things down because you, this is learning. If you break something but you haven't learned anything from it, then yeah, that's bad. But if you break something in the process of trying to learn something, then you're still trying to learn something and you're going to build on those mistakes and those are learning opportunities. So that fear that you have inside that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to break it. Yeah, yeah, I have it too. Don't worry. Uh, making this video is part of it, okay? So as long as you're conscientious and thinking, hey, even the dude that's actually making the video, he's scared. It's okay. It's all about learning. For me, this is about teaching. It's about giving back and, and learning uh, from just everyday products as much as you can. So one of the things that I've done is I've also created a website and I will put the link to the website that has the links, the excels and the analysis that go with this. And, and you can go more in depth and into the references as much as you want. The other things that are going to be coming up, by the way, is taking apart a, a drill and doing the analysis and doing measurements before and after the, the teardown. The other thing that I'm going to be taking apart is this telescope on the side. And, and the goal, remember, is just learn, try to wonder, try to guess what is it that everyday objects have to offer, right? How do they work? How, what's inside? How do, are they made? And this is how I got into it. You know, I was watching how things are made or how it works and I wanted to know more on the analysis of like, how do they know that's gonna work, right? So this is going to be giving you that hybrid flavor between, you know, here's the detailed analysis and hey, I just wanna take something apart. So this is that hybrid, right? So. Bear with me, I may make some mistakes along the way. Just, you know, comment on the bottom below. I may call something the wrong name or something. Just, just bear with me and let's have fun with this.